layout. Oh, okay. And I'm going to make Patrick. Uh, where are you? You're the co-host, so you can share. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Denver Gophers Meetup. This is October 2020. Almost there. Almost there, everyone. Uh, today, we have Patrick Barker. He's going to be talking about some really cool uh, tooling uh, written in Go that um, enables uh, folks to do some machine learning stuff. So, Patrick, uh, all up to you. Take it away. Feel free to introduce yourself if you like introduce yourself some more. And uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Patrick Barker. I'm an uh, engineer for VMware. I work with Warren kind of on a, on a different team. Uh, so you moved me into this. Um, I've uh, been running Go for a while. And uh, lately, I decided to kind of see how far I could take uh, Go and machine learning. I've been doing machine learning stuff for four or five years. I got really frustrated with Python and uh, decided how to see how far I could take with Go. So I'm going to talk today about um, where I kind of got with that stuff and uh, give you kind of a brief overview of kind of the ML stuff going on with Go. And uh, yeah, hopefully that's, uh, that's all good. Um, so why Go? Uh, obviously we have the main languages of machine learning are Python and C++. Uh, so why not Python? Almost all machine learning is in Python. I think if you look at it statistically, it's something like probably close to 80 to 90%. And you know, next to that, you have like R and Julia and some of these other languages. Um, it doesn't have type safety. Uh, it's really slow outside of direct C calls. Uh, this isn't a huge ordeal if you're like directly using a computational graph, like something you'd find in TensorFlow or PyTorch. But if you're going outside of that, like things you do in reinforcement learning, uh, Python's a really slow language. Uh, the type safety thing makes it pretty hard to understand what you're doing in Python. So there's just so much magic kind of happening in Python uh, that it, it, it gets hard to understand like, to really learn it. I felt like writing a lot of these algorithms in Go, I actually learned them way better uh, doing it that way than I ever did in Python. So those are kind of my arguments against Python. C++, I think those are pretty obvious arguments why you want to do this and that. Slow development, really hard to understand debug. Obviously there are use cases for writing this stuff in C++, but it's, uh, it's not something you probably want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, uh, it's pretty painful to do data science in C++. Uh, but a lot of lo the low level tooling, a lot of the machine learning compilers, stuff like that is all written in C++ today. Um, yeah, so overview of like the fields of machine learning, there are like a lot more than what I'm listing here. These are kind of the top ones you would find. Uh, in supervised learning, you have a model that's trained by a curated set of inputs and outputs. So you could think like, I am trying to detect uh, a human in an image. So it would basically be like the coordinates of a bounding box and it would have just give you the image and then it would, uh, you know, have you try and guess the coordinates of that bounding box and then you would find the error that's in between those and you try and update your model. Uh, unsupervised learning is more just, you have a bunch of data and it's just looking for patterns within that data set. So there's no actual training sets going on. Uh, the, the model's just basically looking to see if it can find patterns. Reinforcement learning, which we're gonna talk a lot about, this is more about an agent acting in an environment to maximize a reward. I, common use cases of this are like robotics. Like if you could think of like, you know, a Tesla factory building uh, all kinds of stuff in there uh, and needing to train those kind of mechanical arms to do certain tasks. Uh, that would be a reinforcement learning job. Also like self-driving cars is an example of reinforcement learning. I, and then kind of a newer one is self-supervised learning. It's sort of a subset of unsupervised learning, but it's basically um, a model learns by just withholding portions of the data that it's looking at and it tries to complete them. So where this has become really popular is if you heard of uh, GPT-3 or BERT or any of that stuff, these language models, uh, they all do massive self-supervised training. So they will actually go and just scan the entire internet and they'll take all the sentences from everywhere and they'll basically just take parts out of those sentences and then they'll try and see if they can complete them. Uh, and it turns out if you do this at a massive scale with models that cost millions of dollars to train, that you'll actually end up with a, um, a really deep understanding of language. So self-supervised learning has become really 
trendy nowadays because it's very popular and you don't need a curated data set. You can actually just kind of learn by, by what's there. I, and like you said before, there's more, there's more fields, but these are kind of the top ones you come across. I, so existing libraries in Go, the most popular one is Gorgadia. Uh, Gorgadia is written by Gunin Chu. Uh, he's pretty cool. Um, it feels a lot like TensorFlow 1. So it's sort of a low level computational graph and you basically are adding nodes to this graph to do computations. And then that graph is optimized and can do things like back, pro back propagation across the graph. That may be a fancy term if you don't know about that, but that's just a way of figuring out what the error is and a way to adjust your neural network. Um, there's a library called Golgi that's built on top of Gorgania and it's sort of a higher level machine learning library. Um, Picking up a little bit of steam now. Uh, the original one was one called Go Learn, and it's a pretty full feature machine learning library. It caught a lot of steam like six, seven years ago, and then it kind of fizzled out. And since then, it's there's a couple people poking around at it, but it doesn't seem like it's really maintained anymore. Uh, there's TF Go, and that's TensorFlow bindings for Go in sort of like a Go native fashion. Uh, that works pretty well, also not super maintained. Uh, Onyx Go is um, running Onyx models in Go. Onyx models are a, uh, they're supposed to be a framework agnostic way of describing neural networks. Um, so you can almost think of it as like the JSON of neural networks. So if I describe a model, <laughs> a neural network model in PyTorch versus describing it in TensorFlow, you know, is there a common uh, data model I could use to describe that so I could go across these frameworks? And that's Onyx. So uh, this guy Oliver wrote that and he's pretty cool. He works with the Gorgania people. Um, and yeah, so you can run basic Onyx models in Go. Uh, it runs with the backend on Gorgania. Far and away, Gorgania is the most popular library that exists today and it is very active. Uh, so what's missing? Uh, when I came into the space, there wasn't a reinforcement learning library, so I wrote that. I also wanted a simple, like, high-level library that's similar to Keras. If you don't know Keras, Keras is just a wrapper on top of TensorFlow nowadays, but it makes uh, the experience of using TensorFlow a lot easier. Uh, and it's, it's just a really simplified machine learning API. It's nice for things like reinforcement learning, because with reinforcement learning, the actual neural network computation is really just kind of one part of the puzzle. And there's a lot of other stuff you're doing. So by keeping that part of the puzzle simple, uh, it makes it a lot easier to kind of write, uh, write these uh, agents. What's uh, The other pieces that are missing are a graphical network library. I haven't seen that yet. No one's written it, could be written. Uh, transformer libraries, I talked a little bit about BERT and GPT-3. Those are called transformers. It's a really interesting sort of uh, model for basically, it does mostly language stuff, but there's currently not one of those in Go. I, so I'm gonna talk mostly about reinforcement learning. Um, sorry. I, you have, this is a basic overview of what reinforcement look, learning looks like. So you have an agent acting in an environment. Uh, so you can think it takes an action in the environment and it gets back a reward. And then it also gets back the next state. So this might seem, some of these things might seem confusing. They're actually really simple. So if you think just, um, if I'm driving a car, I'm gonna take an action that's gonna say, you know, turn the steering wheel like 30 degrees left uh, in my environment. If that was a good move, I'll get back a reward. I uh, kind of depending on the environments, I'll get back a reward or not. Um, and if that was a bad move, uh, I might get back a negative reward, and then I'll always get back the next state. Um, so the, here's some common reinforcement learning terms. I, you have a policy, and this is I, the way an agent chooses its actions. So it's kind of as simple as that, that the agent's always gonna have a policy within an environment. Um, you have model-based reinforcement learning algorithms. That basically means the, the agent is gonna learn a model of the world and base its actions on that. Um, so what that means is if I'm learning to drive a car, I, 
I'm going to begin to understand and I'm going to try and process in my model that when I turn the steering wheel left, I can predict where I'm going to go in the world. So if you think like I'm turning left and now I expect the road, you know, my environment to change in a certain manner, these algorithms are really powerful if you can get them right. The problem is they take so much computational power that it's almost untenable in most environments. So most things go with what's called model three. And that is rather than try and learn the environments, so if I turn left on the steering wheel, I expect my environment to do something. Rather than doing that, it just is basically a reward mechanism. Uh, I took this action and then I took that action and I got a reward. It doesn't really learn about what happens in the world when you take actions. It just learns whether it got a reward or not. I, a large part of our brains are actually model three. We don't know we, we we don't know for certain whether we have model based parts of our brains, but we do know for certain that we have model three parts of our brains, which is pretty interesting. So we have parts of our brains that basically work off dopamine, and when you take an action that's good, it basically like triggers a uh, a reward mechanism within your brain where you get a little shot of dopamine, you feel happy, and the last several actions that you took to get there it sort of solidifies those actions in your brain as, hey, this is something I might want to do in the future. So you could think of, you know, if you get addicted to cigarettes because you, you did that and you felt a reward, and so now your brain begins to harden these pathways. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that we know for certain based on science that that's actually how our brains work. What's even more interesting is um, this was one of the few instances where machine learning actually informed neuroscience. So most of the time in most machine learning, we actually look at the brain and we say, how does the brain act? And we try and then put that into code and make sense of it. This is one of the few instances where we actually discovered this algorithm, which is, um, it's, it's called the Bellman equation. Um, it's a really kind of basic form of uh, what's called distributional acute learning. Uh, and they just kind of like developed this in a, you know, messing around with different machine learning algorithms. Neuroscientists looked at it and were like, hey, I wonder if that's how the brain actually works. They went and did a bunch of studies and it turns out that is the case. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool that we actually figured out how those things work kind of based on, uh, you know, this kind of reversed uh, input. Um, you also have on policy models and that basically means an agent takes its actions directly from a policy and then you have off policy that means an agent uh, may use its policy and it may use other processes. The other processes there are usually just random actions. So it might look to its policy and say, hey, what's the best action I could take? And I may or may not take that. I may just take a random action in this case. Um, so I wrote this library Gold, which is a simple reinforcement library, learning library in Go. I, it has a bunch of common agent implementations, algorithms, Q learning, deep Q, PPO, reinforce, Ness and her. I'm gonna go kind of through what each of those are. Um, it also has a composable framework for building agents. So if you wanted to build more agents uh, and implement you know, different algorithms, it'd be pretty easy to do that. It has kind of a data tracker and visualizer. Uh, if you know about TensorFlow, there's TensorBoard, which is kind of a way of tracking how you're how your model is performing, and I wrote one of those in Go. Uh, and then it has an API-based reinforcement learning environment server. So there's a thing called Open A OpenAI Gem. I don't know if you know OpenAI. It's Elon Musk's company that does a bunch of machine learning stuff. They do a lot of reinforcement learning. They wrote kind of a Python framework called Gem. And it's just a way of easily uh, training agents and uh, interacting with your agents. I because there was no great way to kind of get there and go, I just wrote a gRPC server that basically serves those Python gem environments and you can learn it from Go. Uh, that turned out to work okay. It's all just kind of streaming gRPC. Most of it's happening locally, so it's fast enough to, uh, to work out around. Um, so I'm gonna run through like some basic algorithms. Uh, so Q learning is, is kind of the, the original form of reinforcement learning is developed back in the 60s. By Richard Bellman. Um, it's really, really basic. Uh, this equation that you see at the bottom is, it looks complicated. It's actually pretty simple when you see it in code. Uh, but basically it's, when I take an action, I'm gonna sort of rank uh, how much reward I got from that action and how much reward I got from the previous action. 
and I'm just going to save those values into a table. So I'm going to essentially at each at each step in an environment, say I take a step somewhere, um, I'm going to execute this equation, and I'm just going to say, hey, where was I last? Did I get a reward from that? I'm at this step now. Did I get a reward from that? And based on that, I'll have a key value. So when I come back to that place again, I can understand what's the best action I can take to the next to the next place. And as you begin to explore over time and take a bunch of these actions, I uh, eventually those key values will converge to what is the maximum reward for that environment. There are instances where it may not converge and the environment is just too complex for this uh, basic key learning equation. Um, but this is a sort of GIF of how key learning works. So what's happening in the blue is basically you're taking a step and you have you know, the light blue are the options of where you could go next and where you could take a step. Uh, and then the reward you can see in the middle there. Um, and the idea is to step towards that reward. So the agent's gonna kind of explore around and it's slowly gonna learn, uh, you know, based on where it is, what square, it's, what square it's on, what step it should take, you know, in which direction to get closer to reward. It's just going to slowly, as it explores, just update these key values that are in a database, and then as it goes back, it's going to say, "Hey, I'm at you know whatever coordinates. What's the key value for this? You know, going here, here, or here?" And it'll slowly learn what what the best steps are. Um, there's also deep Q learning. So deep Q is basically the exact same thing, but now we use a neural network to approximate the key values. So remove the database, put a neural network in between, and now you basically have deep Q learning. Uh, agents are also often augmented with memory. So now as you step through that environment, you basically save a bunch of memories of what happened. And then you feed those to the network periodically to train it. Uh, as far as I saw this state and that ended up in a reward or it did not. Um, so that's, that's deep key learning, that's pretty popular. Another popular one is natural evolution strategies. This is where you basically take a bunch of agents and you uh, randomly instantiate their parameters um, at each uh, interval. You see how well they do at each interval. You take the best part of that population. You then regenerate based on the, that population with a bit of mutation. And then you just do this over and over again by taking the best portion of the population. And eventually you'll uh, converge on your world. So you can kind of see what's happening here. Version one, two, three. And you're just taking the best out of each of these populations and you're just deviating them slightly. Uh, and this is sort of a visualization of what that ends up looking like. So you can think of each frame as being a different sort of test of that population. Uh, and it'll slowly just converge towards the solution. Policy gradients are another really popular one. There's an algorithm called Reinforce that was one of the original uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. This uh, is where you directly optimize the policy based on cumulative discounted rewards received at that point. So it's very similar to key learning, except instead of looking at just the previous action, we're actually going to look at all the actions that have taken to that point. And I'm, and we're also going to um, discount the later actions. So we're going to weight more heavily the earlier actions, and that's just because the actions that you take earlier in a chain of actions often have more impact than the later actions you take. Um, there's another algorithm called hindsight. And in hindsight, um, you basically learn from any and all experiences. So this is really useful when there's an environment with sparse rewards. So often in robotics, you have very sparse rewards. So it's like, you know, take this thing and put it in here. And there's just so many actions you can take. The space is so wide that um, you know, in order to get to that place, um, you will essentially, a lot of times the robot will fall into a place where it just never gets a reward and never learns anything. So hindsight is a way of basically storing this stuff all in a buffer and just saying, we're gonna give you a reward just for getting somewhere. We're gonna give you a little reward just for learning, having learned anything, essentially. And it's really interesting that this ends up working. Um, I guess I'm I've seen some slides I thought I had. I, uh, but it's working really well, particularly you know in these robotics environments. They'll slowly find their way through the space, and they'll get to the actual reward. 
and they'll learn kind of the chain of how they got there. Um, challenges with Go. I, so as I went through and I, I wrote all this stuff in Go, I came across a couple of things. I, acceleration is really hampered by the Seago FFI speeds, which are, are about 200 nanoseconds of overhead per call. I, so if you think Moose machine learning uses like uh, GPU processes, so you want to be able to take these actions as fast as possible and learn as fast as possible. Most of the machine learning models have, um, you know, upwards of thousands to hundreds of thousands of parameters that you need to update. Those computations are just extremely intensive. Uh, so in order to do that, you often want to use GPUs for them. Pretty much all of the GPU libraries are written in C. And because Seago has this 200 nanosecond FFI overhead, I, it's a little bit of a hindrance. Now, normally when you train, you do it on batches. So you're doing such a large batch of stuff that it doesn't matter too much. When you get into reinforcement learning, you end up doing a lot more online learning and it does affect it to an extent there. So it kind of depends on what you're doing with it, but this is largely due to Go's memory model and the fact that <clears throat> how Go kind of has memory arenas uh, that does not map to a C stack well. So it has to basically trampoline over to a C stack. You'd either need to do that or have a C stack per Go routine. And that would just be so much overhead, it wouldn't make sense. So they trampoline to a C stack. That trampolining costs time. Um, this is probably one of the biggest hindrances to Go right now. It's not that big of a deal if you're doing supervised learning. It can become more of a deal uh, with other stuff. The lack of generics is also quite painful. Um, just obviously this is getting fixed in Go right now. They're trying to get it for Go too. But scientific computing, generics are really, really useful, particularly for like tensor libraries. Uh, doing any sort of matrix computations, this becomes really, really useful. Uh, so hopefully we'll have generics soon and we'll solve this problem. And yeah, that is the majority of it. Um, I was going to just do a quick demo of the library. So we're going to run this deep Q agents. Kind of see the Q learning. Show you. Going to run this carpool algorithm, and this is sort of what the agent looks like. It breaks down pretty simple. Um, I'm going to create a server. It's going to pull Docker container here. Sorry, I still wanted to actually pull that container earlier. So um, while we're waiting, actually, Patrick, um, I believe Leon had a question regarding the algorithm that um, first discovered. Uh, uh, Leon, actually, if you <laughs> feel free to unmute and ask the question. Maybe not. I think he was asking for the name of the, the person that uh, the algorithm was first discovered and proved to exist in the in the human brain. I think you were talking oh, about the- yeah, yeah. Um, so Bellman originally came up with the algorithm, but it's not technically, uh, it's not technically Q-learning. So Bellman came up with Q-learning. Uh, this is distributional Q-learning, but I can, Post the um, if I can find the paper. 
it's a really interesting read. Um, yeah, so we're running now, we're running this DQ agent, and this is the game that we're playing. It's called Cart Pull. So what happens in this game is you have a cart on a pole, and the cart is obviously the pole is obviously going to fall over. Uh, and your job is just to push the cart left or right. <laughs> and you can kind of see the environment reset and it'll reset after it hits a certain angle because it knows you can't recover from that angle. Uh, but the idea is to teach the agent to just push the cart left or right at each time step until it can perfectly balance the cart. Uh, and I believe, you know, balance it to at least 200 time steps. Um, this is kind of the most like hello world reinforcement learning problem. Uh, so for each time step, it stays up, it, it gets a reward. And slowly this deep neural network is going to learn uh, based on the rewards it's getting, you know, to push the cart left or right to balance it. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side, we can see our score is slowly starting to converge. Um, the epsilon here is our exploration. So because this is an in off policy model. That means we're not directly learning from our policy. We're actually doing a little bit of random exploration, but that random exploration is something that decays over time. So we start out by exploring a lot. We basically explore every step just randomly. And then over time, as the algorithm kind of progresses, we, we slowly kind of titrate down that um, exploration parameter. And, you know, we never take it down to zero. We take it down to about 0.1. So it doesn't maybe fall into a bad space. But you can see now it's starting to learn to balance the pull. So we're getting close. That last one came in at 200 time steps. So that's right, that's the max for this environment. And you can see it's uh, it's beginning to balance. Um, and we're still exploring a bit. So we're gonna see it still kind of uh, shudder a little bit and probably, probably continue to mess up until that epsilon gets down to about 0.1. Um, you can see our loss is starting to stabilize a bit. Um, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it. That's the, uh, that is the demo there. And it looks like, yeah, we have just about stabilized at, at 200 time steps now. So it's pretty cool. It's kind of like magic, to be honest, it's a little like magic. So. Uh, it's a very simple example. You can do more complex things. There's, uh, you know, the, the library I was talking about is called uh, OpenAI Gym. If you haven't seen that, but uh, you can use these libraries to play basically any of these games. They have a bunch of like Atari games or just kind of classic control games that you can see here. Uh, like you can play Lunar Lander or Pong or any of that stuff. This stuff takes a lot longer to train. Like, <laughs> Trying to train like a spider to walk takes, takes a lot of time. Um, so yeah, that is uh, the majority of it. I did find that article. Hmm. Does anybody have any uh, questions? Cool. I, I have one, uh, Patrick. So you said like one of the limitations uh, in Go is that uh, because most of these libraries are written in C, so obviously Go has to call out to C Go. But I was kind of curious if uh, like in Python, is do they have similar issues? Because like, does Python, is it just written, like I, if I understand correctly, Python usually calls lower level libraries in C as well. It does, yeah. So and to give a comparison, like Python, JavaScript, Java, their go to CFFIs are uh, like one nanosecond. They're they're almost non-existent. Like Rust is zero. Um, like Rust has absolutely no FFI just because of how it's built. It's kind of amazing. Uh, and a lot of languages are lower. It's both Go and Erlang that have this sort of memory arena style, right? That makes Go so convenient to, to use in so many ways. Uh, that's, that memory style just does not map to C. It, you know, the only way to do it, like Dave Chaney, uh, who was working at VMware for a while, 
he uh, he wrote that article, Seago is not go. And he kind of goes through uh, why that's the case and like what needs to happen there. If you haven't seen that article or read it, uh, it's just Seago is type Seago is not go, Dave Cheney. Uh, but he walks through kind of why that's the case in go. So you get a lot of niceties with those memory arenas. And if you're writing really, you know, writing Kubernetes code like we do most of our days, it's really, really convenient. Uh, if you go to do, you know, accelerated compute, it becomes more of a problem. So. How did I work around generics? Uh, sorry. Oh, were you saying something? No, no, no. Go ahead. I, Brandon, Brendan was asking in the chat how to work around generics. Uh, switch cases <laughs> across, across every go time. <laughs> you're, you're, brave, you're a brave man. <laughs> yeah. it's uh, If you look at the Gorgonia, like low level tensor library, I kind of built on that, but that's what they had to do too. I mean, there's just, you just have to switch across every go time. It's unfortunate. So, yeah. What's FFI again? Uh, foreign function interface. Have you um, uh, tried using GCC Go to get around the FFI issue? As I understand it, it should not have any overhead in that case. Does it not? I haven't heard that. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, if you've Maybe heard to the contrary, then disregard what I said. But since it's essentially just taking Go code and translating it into the same intermediate form that um, any C code that the um, GCC compiler is compiling, it essentially at the you know, at some point in the compilation phase, the C code and the Go code don't look any different because they've been transformed into that intermediate form. Um, sure. So it should just be able to, uh, should just be able to call into C without any overhead. LL Go, which I think is probably kind of an abandoned project at this point, should have <laughs> similar, similar capabilities with LLVM, being able to interface, you know, Go with any of the other LLVM supported languages, but that that definitely is not, as far as I know, a, a maintained project. That's interesting. I didn't look at that. Yeah, I thought I kind of poked around at it a bit, um, but I didn't hear anything about the FFI being lower. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you don't really hear much about GCC Go because it is maintained. I think it might be like one stable release behind um, the main Go tool chain, but. Um, it's uh, it's like the people who needed to use it found it a long time ago, and they just kind of go do their own thing and don't really talk about it. And the people <laughs> who haven't needed to use it don't know about it. So that's good. No, yeah, maybe we'll check that out and see if that's uh, if we can use that. So. Any other questions, thoughts, anything? All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Cool. Well, Patrick, thank you very much uh, for this uh, talk. It was awesome. I'm going to stop the recording now, but uh, we don't have to all leave. If you all want to uh, hang out and chit chat for a little bit, we can do that. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much, Patrick. It was like super insightful. Um, and, uh, yeah, I didn't know it's been a while since I did any ML stuff. So it's good to see that like, there's actually some Go libraries. And, yeah, it was pretty fun. It definitely, like I said, I definitely learned more doing it that way than I ever did with Python. So that was, that was a cool part of it. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.